Walter Kron, guide back at our CBS News Space Center on this Sunday morning, which is destined to be an historic one for the manned space program, either Russian or American, for today. It's supposed to mark the first rendezvous of two manned space vehicles. Gemini 6 is scheduled to be launched at 9.54 this morning. That's 55 minutes from now. And 52 minutes from now, I guess it is. The count, actually, at Cape Kennedy is T minus three minutes and holding a planned hold so that all contingencies can be taken care of and they can get this vehicle off exactly on the second that they want to in order to uh, make that rendezvous with Gemini 7 on the fourth orbit the middle of this afternoon. At this moment, Gemini 7 is out over the Pacific Ocean. It's just cleared Australia. It's just in touch with the Rose Knot Victor, a, uh, a tracking ship out in the Pacific, and is en route back to the uh, United States as it whirls in its eighth day around the world. Scheduled to pass the previous endurance record in space set by the United States in August by Gordon Cooper, Pete Conrad of uh, just short of eight days. Passes that about 1.30 this afternoon. Let's review quickly what this day is all about. The first rendezvous in space with Gemini 6 and Gemini 7. Gemini 7, meanwhile, establishing the longest flight in space. And by the time it returns next uh, at the end of uh, this week, it uh, will have been up 13 days, 181 hours, if all goes as planned, some 206 revolutions. The pilots, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell, have uh, been doing excellently, as has their spacecraft. It's been a perfect flight since they lifted off a week ago yesterday. Uh, they have achieved another first in space, the first space flight in underwear environment. While the Russians put up uh, three men who flew in shirt sleeves, for the first time, Americans have taken off their space suits and flown around in their underwear. That Gemini 7 launch was exactly on the mark at the precise second it was supposed to get off, 2.30 p.m. last Saturday, and their splashdown should come around 8.25 in the morning next uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, December 18th. Gemini 6 is supposed to go off at 9.54 uh, this morning, and uh, they should be coming back if they achieve the rendezvous today, tomorrow morning, around uh, 11.40 a.m. If they do not achieve rendezvous today and all missions have been accomplished, they will then uh, come back on Tuesday morning. If there is a further delay in launching today so that they cannot get off in the window, the period of time when they could still make rendezvous in the next uh, day or two uh, by going off today, they can still go any day this week during a certain uh, window periods of around 47 minutes each and achieve rendezvous with Gemini 7. So uh, a long hold today would not be disastrous to the flight plans. Rendezvous should come around 3.52 this afternoon on the fourth orbit as these two spaceships fly at 17,500 miles an hour, 185 miles above the Earth. The rendezvous itself, the actual closing maneuvers coming over the Pacific Ocean. They will fly in formation within a few feet of each other, uh, with Gemini 6 flying around Gemini 7, first in plane, that is, uh, around in the same orbital path, and then out of plane, around in this fashion. Uh, they'll do that, uh, do it uh, one time each. They'll close and, uh, and then pull away and close again with both the Shara and Stafford handling the controls. They'll do that for about four hours, finally breaking off at around 8.20 uh, tonight. This is all a nominal mission, that is a normal mission, everything going as planned. The astronauts, uh, as you so well know by now, unless you yourself have been on the moon, are in Gemini 7, Frank Borman and James Lovell, uh, both 37 years old, and in uh, Gemini 6, Wally Shara. And here is a first, a first picture, live picture from the aircraft carrier WASP. For this mission, we have some television history as well as space history, we hope. We have the capability, as you see here, of sending a picture from the aircraft carrier WASP. It's about, I think at this moment, around 500 miles off the coast uh, of uh, Florida. And that picture is being relayed to the early bird satellite, back to Earth and to you through uh, CBS uh, television channels and your local CBS station. 
We're hoping through this camera, and if the pictures are as good as this, we will be delighted to see tomorrow morning the recovery of Shara and Lovell, and later on in the week, the recovery of uh, Borman and uh, Lovell, or Shara and Stafford tomorrow, Borman and Lovell on next Saturday. We'll get uh, an immediate picture of them as soon as they're brought back to the aircraft carrier WASP. That's usually within a uh, half hour to 40 minutes of their landing in the Atlantic, uh, some few hundred miles off the coast of Florida. Those occasional little breakups you see in the picture, we're told, are because of the radar aboard the aircraft carrier WASP, uh, a function that we're not about to interfere with, of course, with, with our television cameras, although we have to suffer a few lines from them. This is a live picture at this second aboard the aircraft carrier WASP, where our correspondent, Dallas Townsend, is standing by to give us a report by voice when uh, need be, when the recovery period start. There are the big radar scopes and guns of the uh, WASP. Special radar that uh, helps them establish the return of the spacecraft from space back into the atmosphere and that flaming descent, which uh, is scheduled for Shara and Stafford tomorrow morning. With that radar, they can hook on to that tiny spacecraft of the four tons that uh, is propelled into space. Uh, barely half or less than half comes back, that 18 and a half foot high by seven foot six inch uh, at the widest point, the bottom, three feet two inch wide at the top, capsule comes hurtling back to the surface of the Atlantic. The booster, of course, the 90-foot high, two-stage, three-engine, 430,000 pounds or 530,000, including the second stage. The booster has dropped away long since in the first uh, six minutes of the flight. We can take a look now at one of the dramatic developments of this last week. As Gemini 7 first got up into orbit and began its most successful turns around the Earth, the focus of attention this week shifted to Pad 19. The whole question of whether this rendezvous could be accomplished or not depended on whether Pad 19 could be readied three times faster than it ever had before uh, in order to get Gemini 6 up, for we have only one launching pad capable of handling the man-rated Titan II. Uh, that is Pad 19. Borman and Lovell blasted off on Saturday afternoon and almost before the uh, smoke from their rockets had cleared away. The workmen were on the pad beginning to prepare it. Those technicians on pad 19 have produced a minor miracle in uh, getting uh, the pad ready. It turned out that damage to the pad was greater than in any other of the Gemini launches, including Gemini 1, which had caused considerable damage to the pad. When those 430,000 pound thrust rockets go off with that great blast, they uh, do cause damage, of course, to the erector and to the umbilical tower. Uh, that damage uh, the before this has been repaired in roughly uh, three weeks time. This time they had to do it within nine days. Well, they did it in even far shorter time than that. Here are the Lovell and Borman uh, a week ago yesterday, just eight days ago, they set off jauntily on man's most demanding space mission. A 14-day journey highlighted by a meeting in space with another Gemini capsule, today's hope for rendezvous. A week ago Saturday, they were rookies. Today, as a crew, they've had more experience in space than any other. As the astronauts left the van at pad 19, we looked closely at their spacesuits. They were new, specially designed for the long flight. Eight pounds lighter, almost a third lighter, or 50% lighter, actually, in weight than those worn previously by Gemini pilots. Everything went remarkably smoothly on launch day and in the days that have followed. Even the lightweight spacesuit was to prove unnecessary except for critical periods such as launch and rendezvous, and then only as a safety backup. Lovell took his suit off last Monday, only put it back on on Friday, 
so that Borman could enjoy a day of flight than his long johns. The men of the blockhouse uh, brought off that launch precisely as planned. Here they are. Seemed almost as routine now as the takeoff of a jet plane. Here's how that launch looked to the men on the ground. And here's how that missile looked 10 miles up in the sky to the pilots of the chase planes. We couldn't see the separation. The cloud cover got in the way of our long lens cameras, but the camera in the chase plane recorded it this way, Gemini 7 on its way. There it is, a beautiful shot of separation as the big booster dropped away. The men in the blockhouse had double cause for satisfaction. Let's watch that launch again. Drop the camera's eye to the pad. The Gemini 6 launch was to go off as scheduled. We suggested the pad would have to survive that intense heat of the flames and the smoke, which you got a very vivid picture of there. Walter, news now from Cape Kennedy from the uh, weather forecaster. Here along ICBM Row, which is about seven miles long, we understand now there's a heavy bank of clouds out over the ocean off pad 19. Right here is pad 19. But according to the Cape forecaster, the clouds are running parallel in a northerly direction, so they won't affect launch operations. Over this pad, over pad 19, there's a high, thin, overcast sky. The temperature there, 70 degrees, which is about normal for this time of the year, perhaps a little bit higher. The wind only one to three knots. The humidity out there at the Cape is 92% so that we can understand a little bit about uh, where things are down on the Cape. Here's pad 19, and if you can follow my pointer down to here, this is Gemini Launch Control, where the voice of Jack King has been coming to you from. It's about two and a half miles, two and a half miles away. Let's take a look now, though, at what's been done around pad 19. Since a week ago yesterday, the booster for the Gemini 6 flight was on its way to the pad within a couple of hours of the launch. The story, as you've said, is dramatic and as important as the precision of the launch itself. The space agency had never tried such a fast turnaround before, and it worked even better and faster than anybody expected. The technicians worked through that Saturday afternoon and evening. They repaired what blast damage there was, checked out the cables and the fuel lines to make the pad ready for the huge rocket. And then 10 hours and five minutes after the blast off of Gemini 7, the first stage of the booster for Gemini 6 was ready to go into place on pad 19. Up here, it is now just minutes into Sunday morning and the booster is up. The second stage was swung on top of the first stage by six o'clock, about five and a half hours after this, that the second stage was put up and then the spacecraft itself was wheeled up to the path. Spacecraft and the booster had been stored at the Cape since the failure to launch GT-6 back on October 25th. Now, because the spacecraft and the booster both had been checked out for that uh, late October flight, a procedure that normally takes 29 days was compressed into less than 24 hours. The spacecraft was mechanically mated to its booster on Sunday, just afternoon, 1240, there was only one real problem in the entire turnaround on Tuesday. The onboard computer that's vital for today's rendezvous had to be replaced because of a faulty memory, but even that scarcely slowed down preparations. On Wednesday then, the astronauts, Wally Shira, Tom Stafford, flew a simulated mission. That was a success. And when it ended at 9 p.m., the go-ahead was given for the preliminary countdown for a launch today. Eight days ago, when Gemini 7 was launched, Sharon Stafford hoped to fly tomorrow. Even that seemed like a long shot then. Today's planned launch then is a day earlier than originally scheduled, and there was word from the Cape this morning that it is even conceivable that they could have done it one day earlier. The launch could have taken place yesterday. As an old uh, racing driver, Walter, although I believe you've, you've given that up now, as an old racing driver, uh, I'm told that it's very much like a pit stop in an auto race, what has taken place here at pad 19. When you take off all of the wheels, put new tires in, gas it up, check it over and put it back together in a matter of seconds, well, that's really what has taken place here at pad 19. 